Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 13. Today we're looking at verses 17 through 22. Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 through 22. Now last week we saw that sanctifying the firstborn, which was the preceding set of five messages, that sanctifying the firstborn has some intense doctrinal implications for us. We saw and began an in-depth study of the three divisions of the doctrine of sanctification, which is illustrated in the book of Exodus by the sanctifying of the firstborn and then the wilderness wanderings and then the conquest of the land of Canaan. Now we're going to be talking about how the wilderness wanderings illustrate this second aspect of the doctrine of sanctification. You remember the first aspect is positional sanctification, which is how God sees us in Christ, because he has chosen us from the foundation of the world. And we saw that was true of Israel. We saw many passages dealing with that. We saw the doctrinal statement of that in the New Testament, particularly 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Three different points there that are made in that verse, beginning with the eternal choice of God in the past, prior to the creation of the world, whereby he not only knew we would exist, but he chose us because he had a specific purpose in the glorification of his son, Jesus Christ. Foreknowledge is not merely a matter of God looked down the corridors of history and he saw who would believe and so he chose them on that basis oh they're going to believe so I'll call them my elect that's weak that makes God subject to history rather than making history subject to God that makes prophecy trivial and irrelevant God looks down and sees what's going to happen he says okay so I'll prophesy that that's nonsense we serve a sovereign God who controls the universe. Not a sparrow falls without your father. The very hairs of your head are numbered. God in eternity past made choices. He made predestinating choices. He made electing choices. But within the context of time and space, and sometimes, someday, time will be no more, but here within the context of time and space, God is demonstrating in a very practical way progressive or practical sanctification. He set us apart in eternity past by choosing us. He's working on us right now to conform us to the image of Christ and someday we'll reach that third stage of sanctification when we step out of these bodies and step into eternity. No more sin, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more death. Within the last month we've had two deaths here in the church. Warriors who've gone on, who've gotten through the wilderness wanderings and the battles of Canaan, who are now in the presence of the king. And people, you're going to be there too. Some of you, maybe this week. Maybe this week for me. Maybe today for me. I don't know. Right now, I have a chance, though while time still exists, while I'm still here on earth, to do what we're going to talk about today as we look at different aspects of progressive sanctification. As an introduction to the way of the wilderness last week, we developed the doctrine of sanctification specifically so that we could see what happened when God tests his people. Because as I said then, you and I are going to face the same types of tests that the Jews faced in the wilderness. The question is, will we pass our test? Will we have studied? God has given us a cheat sheet. God has given us the entire history of Israel. He said these things were written for our edification upon whom the ends of the world are come. God has told us what the test is, and he's told us in advance what are the answers to the test. 
Have you studied the test? Have you studied the exam that God gave to Israel? So that you'll know what you are going to face. We'll talk about more of that in just a moment. The Jews had positional sanctification when God chose them and called them out of Egypt. But to obtain progressive or practical sanctification, they had to be tested in the wilderness. That's how God develops practical sanctification in my life and yours, how God brings us to spiritual maturity. And he's going to give us, you and me, tests in the wilderness. We saw a positional sanctification in Ephesians chapter 1. We saw sanctification as uniquely the work of the Spirit of God tied permanently to salvation. We began looking, we didn't see it all, but we began looking at progressive and practical sanctification. We saw the doctrine was related to two things, wilderness wanderings and spiritual warfare. Our current enemies are the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons. The world, the demons, and the devil are our external enemies. The flesh is our internal enemy. We cannot get rid of it in this life. You're always going to fight it. It's always going to be trying to open the door for the outside temptations to get inside. Your flesh is strong. You cannot beat it with the flesh. You can only beat it by the indwelling Spirit of God who is given to every one of you. He's given you a renewed spirit. He's given you a regenerated spirit. But he must empower you if you're going to overcome the enemy. We looked at Galatians chapter 5, that humongous list of sins which are the works of the flesh and contrasted with what we're supposed to be doing, which is walking in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You must walk in the Spirit all the time because I tell you, there are going to be times when your flesh is tempted, when you sort of want to gently close the door on the Spirit of God because that temptation is so real and it's so close and it's so tangible. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that, now get this word, you need to hear, hear this word, it's six letters long, so that ye cannot not that it's hard. You cannot do the things that you would. You know what's right. You know that you want to do it. And Paul talked about that fight in himself. But if you're not walking in the Spirit, you cannot resist the flesh. Oh, that's, a, that's an important lesson because otherwise you will step on the landmine. You will walk in front of the sniper. You will trip into the enemy's machine gun nest and you'll be dead. But if you are led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. The law will never empower you. The law only condemns you. That's why God gave the Ten Commandments to prove that you can't be right with God by yourself. The law condemns, the Spirit gives life. And he tells us the fruit of the Spirit after he lists those horrible sins, which is what we are supposed to be bearing. You can't bear the fruit of the Spirit in the flesh. Did you know that? The flesh will never produce the fruit of the Spirit. The flesh can produce plastic fruit. Some of you have been down here, like at the dime store. You see the plastic bananas and the plastic oranges and the plastic apples and the plastic grapes and you set them in a bowl in the center of your table and they never wilt and they never get old and you also cannot eat them. They have no benefit other than to please the eye. And many of us just want to please the eye. We want people to see things but we don't want to be real. And then he tells us he goes back to that war with the flesh. In verse 24, and they which are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Crucifixion, as we said, is not an instantaneous death. The flesh keeps wanting to get down off the cross. It keeps screaming at you about how much this hurts, and it really doesn't want to be there, and you really ought to be nice, and you really ought to let it down, and you really ought to like it, uh, you know, a whole lot more than you do. You crucify the flesh. 
crucify it with its affections and lusts. You've got your position. Next verse, if we live in the Spirit, that's your position. If we live in the Spirit, now we get to not just positional sanctification, we get to progressive sanctification. Let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not desire vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Because we're all coming to the end of our race, some of us more quickly than others. But young people die too, remember that. Young people die too, I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen with tiny children. I've buried them. I've seen it happen with young teens and older teens and people in the prime of life in their 20s and 30s. Not just old people, I've buried a lot of people. And it always reminds me there is an end to your race. Paul was glad when he got to the end of his race because he had run well. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. That's where we ended last week. Today we have part two of the way of the wilderness. The cleansing work of the Spirit of God in progressive sanctification it's a cleansing work, the cleansing work, the cleansing work. Did you know God wants you to be clean? Did you know that God has provided for it? The blood of Jesus Christ does what? Cleanses us from most of our little sins, right? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. It even cleanses our consciences. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works, that's all that sinful stuff you did, from dead works to serve the living God. God wants you to serve him. The devil wants your conscience to keep giving you pain and pain and pain and making you shrink back every time you try to serve, he reminds you. Every time you try to serve, he reminds you. Every time you try to serve, he reminds you. And you crumble. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. It makes us clean. It purges us. It washes us from dead works to serve the living God. Are you letting your conscience hold you back? The blood of Jesus is available. The cleansing work of the Spirit of God in progressive sanctification is portrayed for us in the wilderness wanderings with the many tests that God gave to Israel. It's also portrayed in the conquest of the land of Canaan. The tests in the wilderness were designed to portray for us those aspects of sanctification that relate to learning to trust God. The first thing we need to do in progressive sanctification, if we're going to walk in the Spirit, is we need to learn to trust God. God says, take this step. You say, well, Lord, I'm not sure about that step. God says, take that step. Well, I, I, it's kind of scary. God says, take that step. Okay, step number one. We're walking the Spirit. Well, no, you're still standing still. God says, take this step. Well, that's a scary step too, Lord. The wanderings had to get them all the way from Egypt to the Promised Land. What if they kept standing there and wouldn't go anywhere? Well, I, I guess I'll take that step. That's a pretty slow walk, isn't it? 
Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The slower you walk, the longer you lounge around in the wilderness. The tests in the wilderness were designed to portray for us the aspects of sanctification that relate to learning to trust God. When you trust him, you follow him. When you trust him, you walk with him. Jesus is not standing still. Walk in the light as he is in the light, and you'll have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. And here it is in the present tense, a continual present. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. There we have it again. You want cleansing for daily things that you do, not just for all the things that were past. To do that, you have to walk in the light. Walk. Walk in the Spirit. Walk. Don't walk in the flesh. Walk in the spirit. Walk in the light. Walk by faith. Those are all the pictures that are given to us of the practical sanctification of living this life. You won't have to walk by faith when you get to heaven. You'll see him. Now is the time we walk by faith. Now is the time we walk in the spirit. Now is the time that we walk in the light because there will be no darkness in heaven. Oh, dear people, God gave us childlike pictures so that we would understand the picture books so that then we could later understand the big theology books. That's why he gave us Israel. That's why we have the Old Testament, so that we can see what happened to them. Because the same things will happen to us if we don't learn the basic lessons. Learning to trust God, that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us. Remember? The light, the Shekinah, did not depart from them by night. The pillar of cloud did not depart from them by day. It was always there. And though we can't see it, it is always here with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us, promised in the book of Hebrews. We must trust him rather than our own stupid, hoarded resources. We pack it away, don't we? Man, we've got to have this much for retirement. And we go to these financial planning seminars that say, now have you really maximized all the money that you've got so that when you retire, it's going to last all the way till you die? You don't know when you're going to die, and neither does the guy who's trying to get you to invest in the stuff that he's selling. He's working on an actuarial table that assumes that you will live so long, you may not live that long. Or you know what? You may live a whole lot longer than that, and you'll run out. If that's what you're counting on, rather than counting on God to take care of you, rather than understanding this money belongs to God, it doesn't belong to me. And I'm God's servant, I'm a steward, and he's going to give me what's necessary for the stewardship that he's entrusted to me. So as long as he wants me to keep on functioning as a Christian, he's going to provide for my needs. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And you know what? When you die, you're not going to take it with you and you won't have had have hoarded all that stuff. Somebody else is going to take it and then they'll get covetous and then they'll start to hoard it. <laughs> but it's sort of a sin that progresses generation to generation. There have been a few like C.T. Studd, a very wealthy man, who gave it all away and went to the mission field. Because he understood only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, that we might learn the way of the wilderness. All we do is bellyache and gripe about it. All we do is moan and groan and complain about it. All we do is talk about how much we want this or much we want that. Instead of saying, Lord, thank you for the wilderness. Because you're burning the flesh out of me. You're learning me to keep it in subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Thank you for the wilderness. Can you say it and mean it? Some of you who are younger haven't seen much wilderness yet. And you won't see much wilderness. Instead, you'll see the second half which we'll talk about in a moment, two things that relate to progressive sanctification is wilderness, and the second is warfare. The wilderness wanderings were followed by warfare. And you're moving into a time, young people, when you're going to 
be astounded at the intensity of the battle. There were some battles that were fought in the wilderness, like with Amalek. But you know something? We think it's wilderness now, and we've had some war now. You haven't seen anything yet. The people of God rebelled against him ten times. Ten times. We're told that specifically in the wilderness training. They didn't like it. They didn't like basic training. They rebelled ten times. And so God ultimately killed all, not some, not most. He killed all of them except for two guys who were over age 20. Everybody who was age 20 and above, God killed them in the wilderness. And the only two who made it were Joshua and Caleb. Because when the spies came back with their reports, only Joshua and Caleb said, God told us to go forward, let's go forward. If he's with us, there's nothing those big giants can do against us. And the other ten spies brought a horrible report, and all the people moaned and groaned and weeped and wailed. And God said, okay, that's it. I'm tired of you people. I'm going to kill you. You know, God says that. He says, I'm tired of you people. I'm going to kill you. He said that all throughout church history, too. Ten times, God gave him ten shots at it. I'm not making it up. And I think it is a warning to us at Bible Presbyterian Church. Let me show you what happens to God's people when they rebel in the way of the wilderness. That's what we're talking about. And that's what we're in right now, the time of training in practical and progressive sanctification. The spies have just brought back their report. Now we're in Numbers 14, beginning in verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the congregation of Israel, children of Israel, murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God we had died in the land of Egypt! They didn't say that when they were in Egypt. Or would God we had died in this wilderness? Seems to me they tried pretty hard to keep alive in the wilderness. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land? God, you don't know what you're doing. You know, when you complain about what God's doing in your life, you're rebelling against God. Wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? That sounds like a good spiritual thing to be concerned about your wife and kids, right? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? Let's go back to the world. You know, in Scripture, Egypt, Egypt is always a picture and a type of the world. And how much we as Christians, you know, we feel the pressure, and so what we want to do is we want to go back. The old flesh keeps opening the door. That was happening here. The flesh was opening the door to their hearts and saying, man, the world is so much easier. They don't have all those restrictions, and there's all the good leaks and levels of Egypt. And they wanted to go back. How many times have you wanted to go back to things of earth? You got tired of living it God's way? You got tired of God's principles? You thought, but the rest of the world seems so successful and they're doing it this way. And God said, don't do it that way. But, but Lord, don't do it that way. But I can see with my eyes. God says, you're supposed to walk by faith. You're supposed to walk with me. You're supposed to walk in the light. You're supposed to walk in the spirit. So that you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh because it will always get you into trouble. Always. No exceptions. The flesh never leads you to that which is truly good. It leads you into a trap. Always. Let us return to Egypt. And then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. Do you think God led his people to junk? Do you think God gives rubbish? Do you think God makes a big promise and you get there and you're disappointed?
the way we act sometimes tells the truth of what's in our heart. We think that what God said is really not best because the other feels so good or looks so good or tastes so good. And we just want it so, so badly. And our flesh tells us it's so good. And all the other people around us who, who have yielded to this temptation, they tell us how good it is and how good it feels and how good they, they think. Oh, man, this is wonderful. And we call God a liar. The land through which we pass to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight us in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Hadn't had much of that in the wilderness, had they? Milk and honey. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. Now get the next two, three words. Only rebel not you see when we moan and groan and complain when we really feel hesitant about obeying God when we really think there's another option when we when we follow the world and the world says this works but what God says doesn't work and we follow the world you know what God calls it he calls it rebellion only rebel not That's how God looks at it. Rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. <laughs> people pleasers. We're the same way. We're afraid of the people around us. We don't want to witness because they might say something. We don't want to witness because we might lose our job. We don't want to witness because somebody might laugh behind our back. We don't want to witness because we won't be invited to the next party. We don't want to witness. We don't want to stand for Jesus because there might be some squishy little problems. The same problem we face is what they faced. This was an example. This is for our edification upon whom the ends of the world are come. Fear ye not the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them. Do you have the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the girdle of truth, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit. Do you have the armor? Their defense is departed from them. Their defense is departed from them and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Two men had a testimony. Two men out of at least two million. I think they were closer to six million. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And it would have happened except God was there. You know, people can't do anything if God decides they can't do anything. Listen to what it says. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me? What was the problem? Faith. They refused to walk by faith. They refused to walk by faith. Did you hear it? They refused to walk by faith. Cry of the Reformation. Just live by faith. That's what we brag in. Do you walk by faith? You talk about it. But then you use the ways of the world. How long will they refuse to believe me? Two things. Rebellion disbelief rebellion disbelief did you get that let me say it again rebellion disbelief that's how God saw it I tremble when I read passages like this because I know I have failed some of the tests I hope it hasn't gotten up to 10 yet the big tests that God gave me, the final exams and the various courses of life that I've had to take. How about you? How long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? And he showed us those signs, though not here. We see it with them. Do we believe his word? 
Do we believe there's a God who can do that? And who will if he wishes? I will smite them with a pestilence and disinherit them. You know how serious it is to be disinherited? Where, you know, your very rich uncle or your rich grandfather dies and you're just, oh, basking in it. He only had one kid and that was your mother and, you know, your mom and dad are both dead and they only had one kid and that's you. And, man, you think, no, Uncle Joe, he had, man, oh, so much money. I mean, he, he owned you know, a house over in these islands out in the Pacific, and he owned a place uh, over in France, and he owned this place uh, in Mexico, and and he had, you know, these huge Swiss bank accounts with billions of dollars in them. And he had a mansion here in the States that was loaded with all kinds of famous painters' paintings, and he's got some of the rarest jewels in the world, and, and he's got so much money in the bank, the banks can't keep up with the interest that they're having to pay him. And it's all mine! And you go to the reading of the will. The reading of the will says, I so and so, Joe Schmachkoff, being of a sound mind, and I'm sure able to get rid of my stuff the way I want to get rid of it. Now, they don't say it quite that way in the will, but that's what it means. And having only one living physical descent, and there's your name. Oh, you're so happy do hereby leave all my money to charity and I will list them below and I disinherit my no good rascal nephew or niece. And then as you sit there in sort of a sweaty puddle the lawyer continues to read the will out loud about all the different charities that your uncle is leaving the money to. Have you ever been disinherited? How would you like to be disinherited by God who owns everything? He's threatening to do it as the children of Israel rebel right on the verge of entering part two of the doctrine of sanctification. He's threatening to do it. He doesn't because of one man. One man stands in the gap. Listen to what it says. I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. He's talking to Moses. Moses was a descendant from Abraham. Moses could have been the progenitor of a brand new nation that would have obeyed God. And God would have gotten rid of all the rest of them. God says it to Moses. Moses has for 40 years been leading these stubborn, rebellious, stiff-necked, snot-nosed people to the wilderness. And all they've done is giving grief. All they've done is belly ached and complained. Moses himself came to God and he says, Why in the world? I'm not their nursemaid. Why did you give me this group of people? Couldn't you have given me somebody better? Moses was sick and tired of their griping and complaining too. But Moses had the right heart. Look what he says. Moses was concerned about the name of God. And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it, for thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them. O oh Lord, if you do that, the Egyptians who saw your mighty power will say he wasn't strong enough to control that group of rebels. In fact, some other people will hear, they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. Oh, the place where they're going. The Canaanites and the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites, the Philistines, they'll hear it. 
suddenly your name will be dragged through the mud where the pagans laugh and scorn. For they have heard that thou art Lord among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them. He's concerned about God's honor. He's not thinking, man, that's great. Ha, I passed my test. I got rid of all two billion of them, two, six million of them, however many there were. I got rid of them, and now I'm number one. Man, I'm sure glad he didn't do that. He thought, how will this affect the testimony of the living God whom I love and serve? Do you think that way? I hope you do. I try to. Look at verse 15. Now, if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them, therefore he has slain them in the wilderness. God, it would destroy your testimony. That's what Moses cared about. What will the world think of God if we do this? Oh, that we might think like that. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying... Now here he's talking about his power, but listen to what aspect of his power he refers to. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy... Forgiving iniquity and transgression. By no means clearing the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. But God, you're a God who's long-suffering. You're a God who's a God of great mercy. You're a God who forgives iniquity and transgression. And so what does he ask in verse 19? Just one more time, Lord, please. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy. Here is the power of God to restrain his own wrath. According to thy great mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Lord, I've seen it for 40 years. I've watched it. Forgive them. And the Lord said, Do you want to know the power of prayer? Do you want to know the power of prayer? Look at this verse. Verse 20. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. Intercessory prayer on the behalf of sinful people who had tested not only God's patience, but tested Moses' patience. And Moses interceded for them when he could have gotten everything for himself. And God said, that's right, Moses. You have the right heart. You have the right attitude. I will pardon them according to your word. Do you give up on people that you pray for? People who perhaps are making you mad, perhaps somebody at work, perhaps somebody who's over you or under you or a co-worker, some relative, some friend who is turning out not to be such a good friend. And in disgust, you say, I'm not going to pray for them anymore. Remember Moses. It's a powerful picture. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. He says, I'm going to pardon them. But there are temporal consequences to sin. 
I will forgive them. I won't kill all of them. I won't just make you a nation in place of them. But I will be glorified because there has been sin, because there has been rebellion, because there has been disbelief. Verse 22. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in the land of Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, verse 23, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. They never made it to the second half of the course. They failed at the end of semester number one. They weren't allowed in to semester two, which is the second half of learning about the doctrine of sanctification. A major point is made about that incident in the New Testament, but our time is up. So the Lord willing, we'll pick it up next week. In fact, two major passages in the New Testament talk about precisely what's happening there and how they failed their tests. And how I pray that God will keep us from failing our tests. You know, a generation in Scripture is 40 years. This church is over 75 years old now. First generation is gone. We're second generation. Are we going to fail this test of the first generation? How about the second test, which was given to that second generation? Bible Presbyterian Church, will it die in the wilderness? Will it go into the land of Canaan and be defeated and ultimately, because of rebellion, go into an Assyrian or a Babylonian captivity? Folks, the Bible tells us two or three times that those things that happened to them were written for us. The question is, are we learning? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We confess our sin, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, your word is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts, not merely the actions, but the thoughts and the intents, that is, the motivations of the heart. We are open and naked before you with whom we have to do. We can hide nothing. You see us. Help us to learn what Israel refused to learn when they rebelled. Help us to walk forward, not be in a state of disbelief or unbelief as they were. Help us to walk by faith. Help us to walk in the light. Help us to walk in the spirit so that we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And then with joy give us victory, for in Christ alone we have the victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for today is number 